welcome back. Thank you for joining us again. Today, we are going to talk about insurance in superannuation and the pros and cons of having insurance inside super. Joining us today is an industry colleague with loads of experience in this area. I have invited Fabian Bissoletti. He's got over 26 years of experience in superannuation, and I'm so grateful to have him join us today. Before we go ahead, if you haven't already, please click like and hit that bell notification so that you'll be notified once I post something new. Hi, Fabian. Thank you so much for agreeing to join us with this in Super Collab session. We have on this channel a lot of people are actually um, appreciating the the ability to listen in, and then um, they they do understand um, it better when there's a conversational topic that comes through. Um, I might just ask you to give us a bit of a profile and your background. Yeah, sure. Um, and and good morning, good day. <laughs> um, thank, you, thank you, Princess, for having me. Um, so, look, in terms of my background, um, I guess I've spent well over 20 years as a, as a technical person within the superannuation um, environment. And as a technical person, I guess my main function is really to support financial advisors and different people within the superannuation structure around how the superannuation rules work um, from a tax point of view, um, in terms of the rules that relate to accessing superannuation, making super contributions and those sorts of things. So largely um, uh, having spent quite a bit of time uh, trying to educate advisors and, and others around the place. That's great. And, you know, lucky them, the, the financial advisors get the benefit of your wisdom. But I thought this would really be good because, you know, not everybody wants to speak to a financial advisor. And it just helps to probably share some of our expertise with just the general community. And I know there's some work going on with the quality of advice review. So maybe there will be some changes there eventually. But today, we're, we're just going to cover off and some the benefits of um, insurance inside or outside super. So just, just as an overview, I know that a lot of us, if we're working within um, this industry, you would get default insurance through your employer. Sometimes that would be inside super. For some paternalistic employers, they would just pay for insurance outside of super. But just at the next level, just to help people understand, what would be the difference, the different type of structures with insurance that's held inside super? Yeah, well, I guess when, when we're talking about insurance held through superannuation, I guess the big difference between insurance held through superannuation and insurance held personally is the owner of that policy. And I guess because it's held inside super, the owner of that policy uh, will be the trustee of that superannuation fund. And yeah. the trustee of the superannuation fund, be it a small fund or a large fund, um, essentially holds that policy on behalf of uh, on behalf of the member that um, the, the member of that fund, they're, so they're, so they're looking after their members essentially. Yeah, and that would be in in a superannuation fund. That would be a group arrangement where there is a trustee entity, but is it in a um, in a an SMSF, which is a self managed super fund. How does that yes. work? Yeah, so much the same way. Um, so the, again, it, it, the, the policy ownership rests within the self-managed super fund for those who run their own funds. And so in that situation, the trustee or the trustees of the self-managed super fund would also be the owners of that policy um, instead of the, the individual member themselves owning that policy. And so with your self-managed super funds, you, you're either going to have a, uh, a corporate trustee structure or an individual trustee structure. Um, so if it's a corporate trustee structure, normally that's a company setup. So it might be ABC Proprietary Limited as trustee for the ABC Superannuation Fund. And that corporate entity, the ABC Proprietary Limited, in that instance, as the trustee, would be the owner of the life insurance policy. Um, and, and, and I guess that's, in a sense, mirrors what happens in the larger funds um, where the policies are owned by the, the larger corporate entities. So just to help me understand, like, I can set up an SMSF, for example, with my whole family, cousins, relatives, and we can choose amongst us who will be the trustee. Is that is that how it would work? Yeah, so there are some rules around who needs to be a trustee. And so generally speaking, if you think about a trustee structure where, uh, oh, sorry, a self-managed super fund structure rather, 
the self-managed super fund structure is is typically family members, and so uh, you, you, you've got a close knit group of people. Now, when you're talking about the trustee structure for a self-managed super fund, the, the rules actually require that all the members of the fund are actually trustees of the fund. So if it's yourself and, a, and, and two of your family members, for example, then there's three of you, then all three of you would have to be trustees of that fund if you had an individual trustee structure. Um, and on the flip side, if you had a corporate trustee structure, then all three of you would have to be directors of that corporate entity. Got it. Okay. But it's heavily regulated, isn't it? I can't just decide today to set up my own SMSF just so I can take control of all of my super monies in, in my arrangement. Yeah, well, there's certainly rules that govern what trustees can and can't do. I mean, the superannuation system is designed um, to encourage and help people to save for their retirement. And so we have a, a, you know, a set of rules that govern what superannuation funds can and can't do. And, uh, and that, uh, that also factors in what trustees of the super fund can and can't do. Um, but there's nothing to stop you or I setting up our own self-managed super fund if we wanted to and if it was appropriate for our own circumstances um, and, and rolling our money into our self-managed super fund and, in fact, taking control of our super. That's I think is actually one of the main drivers as to why people set up self-managed super funds in the first place, because they they are seeking control of their super. But but as you say, there are there are quite extensive rules and regulations that fund trustees need to follow. Um, and and running a self-managed super fund isn't necessarily an easy uh, task. And so it's certainly something that should be done with advice uh, to make sure that starting a self-managed super fund is actually the right thing to do for your circumstances, depending on on, on where you land. Sounds like that whole session, that's calling for a whole new session in itself. It, it could it? be. It could be. It would be. <laughs> Sounds actually. good. Um, can yeah. I ask what, what types of um, cover is allowed inside super and outside of super? Yeah. So I guess if we think back to superannuation, and, and I touched on earlier the idea that uh, super is in, designed to help people save for their retirement, um, you generally can't access super before you retire unless um, something unfortunate happens, such as financial hardship, you, you're suffering financial hardship, uh, you're accessing money on compassionate grounds or, or disability and those sorts of things. And so the simplest way to answer your question, I think, is that the type of cover that you are permitted to hold within a superannuation fund essentially has to mirror the rules that allow you to access super in the first place. Mm. And so we're talking about things like um, cover for permanent incapacity. So that's TPD cover. Yeah. We're talking about uh, uh, cover for tempering capacity. So that would be income protection cover. And I guess we were also talking about uh, cover for death, so life cover. Um, but then even within those three, there might be some restrictions also because the rules that relate to accessing super under permanent incapacity, for example, um, require that you are unable to work again. Um, and so it would also limit the type of TPD cover that you could have inside super to uh, an any occupation type arrangement as opposed to an own occupation type policy. So, so there are some limitations, um, but essentially if we're talking about death, TPD and IP cover, um, generally speaking, they're the types of cover that you would expect to see within the superannuation system. What about terminal illness? Would that be allowed inside super? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So terminal illness uh, uh, also, again, aligns to a condition of release. And so, uh, yes, you could have terminal and, and you'd often see that, uh, that that in place as well. What about trauma? Yeah, the, I mean, trauma yeah, tra used to yeah. be named, uh, some name it critical illness, some call it trauma cover. Is that yeah. allowed? No. So, that, so trauma is since 2014. The rules have been very specific around sort of trauma. Yeah. Uh, and so because trauma uh, cover doesn't align to a condition of release, you, you'd end up in a situation where if you if you suffered a trauma event, let's call it a heart attack, but mm -hmm. you weren't permanently disabled or, or, or otherwise able to access your super, the trauma proceeds would come into the super fund because remember the super fund is the policy owner. Uh, and then those proceeds would be trapped there because you wouldn't have a way to release that money from the superannuation system. And so those rules were tightened up in 2014 to make yeah. sure that those unfortunate sort of situations don't arise going forward yeah so yeah. you touched briefly on tpd cover there so would all types of tpd definition be allowed inside super yeah look, not all types i mean again it, it needs to be a, a policy that is going to match the condition of release which is permanent incapacity and 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 the permanent incapacity condition of release uh, requires a member 
to be able to satisfy the fund trustee that they're unable to work, that they're unable to go to work as a result of their illness or injury. And so that's really a, a pretty broad requirement because it doesn't mean that you just can't go back to work in your current job. It means that you can't go back to work in any job and the trust, you, you know, the medical evidence needs to support that. And so as, a, as, a, as maybe an obvious example, if we tried to have a TPD policy which had an own occupation definition, well, the own occupation definition will pay, or the insurer will pay the super fund in the event that you are unable to work in your own occupation, but that doesn't prevent you from working in a different occupation from an insurance policy perspective. Yeah. Um, but those monies would remain locked in the super system because you wouldn't have met the permanent incapacity condition of release. And so when we're talking about TPD specifically, we really need to align to an, any occupation style of definition so that the insurer will only pay the proceeds into the super fund when you are when they are satisfied that you can't work in any occupation and that then aligns to the superannuation condition of release meaning that the money should flow through nicely yeah okay so i know that when they introduced this change back in 2014 i think as part of stronger super yep, they've right. um they we used to allow you know own occupation definitions what would happen there? Like for those policies that got grandfathered, does that mean that an insurer would be under obligation if you've met the definition? They would still pay the benefit, but it's just stuck inside your super account. That's that's the risk that is run where those situations wow. are in place. Yeah, because the insurer, as you say, the insurance is a uh, insurance policy is a contract essentially, isn't it? Right. So, yeah. um, so the insurer is under an obligation, as you say, to pay the proceeds of that insurance when the terms of that insurance contract have been met. And if the insurance contract says that we'll pay you when you are unable yeah. to work in your own occupation, then then that's what they're going to have to do. That's um, all right, then, because then it'll still yeah. earn truckloads of interest. It'll stay in your super account. Um, yeah, you just well, can't well, access true. it until you deteriorate further, isn't it? Well, that, that is true. So it's a, I guess that's really a question of how, uh, as to the reason for why you took that cover out in the first place. So if the cover <clears throat> was taken out um, with a view to repaying a mortgage, for example, well, then that's not going to be able to achieve, potentially, potentially not going to be able to achieve that purpose. Um, but but yes, the money is still going to be paid into your super fund. It'll still sit there. It just means you won't have access to it. And, and, and that could yeah. be critical depending on the reason yeah. for taking out the cover. Yeah. What about cost? In terms of um, paying for the cost of your insurance cover inside or outside of super, are yeah. there, um, I know we're bordering on tax and that's a completely different expertise, uh, which might also be right up your alley. But um, can we just mm -hmm. talk about if I were deciding whether to keep insurance that I got inside my super by default, for example, but I've also got insurance that I took up outside of super, how do yeah. I decide which one's better for me, whether it's, you know, paid from my after-tax dollars or my, you know, super account? Yeah, well, there's a couple of things there, Princess, that come to mind, really, um, because, you know, if, if we're talking about cover that's held uh, as part of a default arrangement um, through through your employer super plan, um, then I guess in those situations, we're, we're possibly talking about group cover or a group policy. And in that situation, I'd expect that the premiums themselves are likely to be cheaper than what they might be uh, in, a, in, a, in a more of a retail sort of individual policy sort of uh, arrangement. So, that, so that's a consideration. Um, but in terms of in terms of the structuring, if we take if we assume the same policy was held inside or outside super um, on a like for like basis, then uh, there are some tax advantages that you might be able to achieve through holding that cover inside super. And so you know you touched on um, contributions and before tax and after tax, and I think that's that's one of the ways in which the premium cost after tax to the member of the super fund can be reduced because if you're an employee, then an option that may be available to you through your employer is salary sacrifice, for example. Mm -hmm. Now, without wanting to go into a salary sacrifice too deeply, essentially what it is, it's, it's your, your employer is paying your pre-tax, uh, some of your pre-tax salary into superannuation. And so you can save tax on a personal level because you're not receiving that income and that money is being put into superannuation to cover your insurance premium. So that tax saving represents a, a you know a, an efficiency or, or a tax benefit to the the member. 
Um, for people who aren't um, uh, who are self-employed or, or, or whose employer may not offer salary sacrifice, most individuals nowadays are able to claim a tax deduction for super contributions. So you or I could make a contribution to super and there are some administrative steps that we need to follow. But if we follow those steps, when we do our tax return, we can claim that super contribution as a personal tax deduction. Mm -hmm. And so if that contribution is being used to fund an insurance premium, then we are actually going to reduce the overall cost to ourselves in, in, in paying, that, uh, paying that premium cost. Uh, and then there's other benefits, right? Because, of course, there's a government co-contribution, which is mm -hmm. targeted more at the lower to middle income earner type, type person. Mm -hmm. um, and that's not a tax deduction. Um, but the government will, t if you meet the eligibility criteria, the government will tip in an additional amount into your super. So, mm -hmm. so that's almost getting the government to partly pay for your insurance premium if you're eligible for that sort of thing. So, um, so certainly there are some tax advantages or tax opportunities maybe, depending on your personal circumstances, uh, as to why it would make sense to hold cover inside super as opposed to outside super. But it comes with a big warning, uh, and that is that once you hold cover inside super, not only do you have to follow all the rules that we spoke about a moment ago, um, but we then uh, create the possibility, and I say possibility um, because it's not always the case, mm. but there is a possibility that tax may be payable when proceeds are accessed down the track, whether it be TPD or death, there may be some tax payable. And so you, you need to carefully consider the, the back end before you jump in uh, because of the front end benefits of super. Yeah. So just before we proceed, I should remind everybody yeah. that we're not financial advisors. We're just generally okay. talking about some of the pitfalls, advantages, disadvantages of, you know, inside and outside super arrangements. I should probably supplement as well there that sometimes having cover inside group isn't always um, cheaper because you could be a white collar worker that's actually um, because when they price that cover it's priced at a group level so they will consider the overall profile so say for example if you're um, within a fund where most of the uh, members are construction workers for example but you're a CEO primarily focused on sedentary white collar work you may not actually benefit from the um, benefits of cheaper premiums in group because you're in a group that's actually a higher risk and more expensive. So that's why it's more expensive in retail because you're priced based on your own profile, your own risk profile. Definitely. So I wanted to come back to your comment about condition of release um, when paying yeah. benefits. So when a, a claim is approved, Inside, what's the difference? Who Who is the money paid to when it's inside super and when it's outside super? Yeah, well, no, and that's an important question because I think that that helps to understand some of the rules and, and, and also some of the tax implications, I guess. But but as we sort of touched on earlier, the, the policy owner is the super fund tr trustee. Yeah. And so uh, in, in the first instance, when a, a claim is lodged with the life insurer, the life insurer will pay those proceeds to the superannuation fund trustee. And then the superannuation fund trustee receives the money. And as a super fund trustee, it has an obligation to make sure that it doesn't pay the money to the member of the fund unless a condition of release has been met. And so there is that two-step process that needs to be followed. Now, with some of the larger insurers, perhaps, um, it might be that from a the customer's perspective, it looks like it's a payment direct from the insurer to the member. But it needs to. But, but, but from a strategic point of view, from a structural point of view, there is a two-step process that's actually occurring before the member receives his or her uh, proceeds. Because the, the trustee also needs to make the, its own determination, isn't it? it Absolutely. Doesn't just accept whatever the insurer. That's right, um, and that's right, and 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 the and the rules that are the insurer are, are, are working under are different to the rules that the super fund is working under because the insurer is following the contract terms um, under the insurance contract, whereas the uh, the super fund trustee has to abide by the superannuation rules um, yeah. as, well as, its own, as well as its own trustee potentially, uh, yeah. trust deed rather. So you briefly touched on some tax advantages of having your insurance inside super. Are you able to just expand a little bit more on that one, Fabian? Yeah, sure. So... So the tax advantages, I think we sort of touched on in terms of 
a number of ways to to make the cost of that cover a little bit more affordable given circumstances. But I, I think the main thing is that I, I sort of touched on at the very end of my response that whilst you might be able to create some benefits from a premium perspective, you're potentially unlocking uh, or creating a tax burden when you receive the proceeds from that policy uh, down the, at the back end. So when you when you suffer, when you, you pass away uh, and a death benefit is paid, or perhaps when you become permanently incapacitated and the TPD proceeds um, are, are paid to you. And so it, if we break that down a little bit, I mean, superannuation benefits, um, when you die, as an example, depending on who receives those benefits, they may be tax payable. And so if I were to pass away and my super monies were to go to my spouse, well, my spouse is a dependent for tax purposes. And as a dependent for tax purposes, there'd be no tax payable. But if I were to die and leave my money to my imaginary child who was 40 years of age and totally independent, um, then my 40-year-old independent child would pay tax on the proceeds, on, on the taxable portion of the proceeds that they receive, right? And so if I decide to hold my insurance cover inside super, I might get a tax saving on the premium side, but if I'm going to leave that money when I die to an adult independent child, as an example, then that child is potentially going to be subject to tax on the proceeds, which they wouldn't have paid if I'd held that policy outside super. And I think that's why, again, it comes back to making sure that we're getting advice and understanding our own personal situation and how holding cover insights or outside super is going to benefit or work against us. Because the other one is TPD, right? Because TPD, once again, we spoke about the condition of release. You can only access it if you're permanently incapacitated. But if I access money uh, from my super when I'm because I'm permanently incapacitated and without giving too much away, I'm still under 50. Um, so if I access my super, I'm potentially going to pay some tax on the taxable portion of my superannuation proceeds. And that also, again, includes insurance. So if, I've hold, if I hold my TPD cover inside super, then when I receive the proceeds, it'll be a combination of the insurance proceeds as well as my savings in super. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and there might be some tax payable if I'm not yet 60, as an example. Um, yeah. And so by deciding to hold my insurance cover inside super, I'm likely to, well, I may pay tax on the proceeds yeah. where I definitely wouldn't have paid proceeds, tax on proceeds if I'd held that insurance outside super. So there is a trade-off, uh, and that's a trade-off that your listeners would want to bear in mind um, before they before they decided to, to take any action. Uh, yeah, their- yeah. Probably just a timely reminder as well, a common misconception for people is they think that they're super. Um, it's actually quite separate to your uh, your will, so your estate, it, um, people think that just because they've got a will and they've, you know, whatever their wishes are in their will, it's it's not bound by your, um, no. your, your super is a separate amount that will be paid and must be paid to a human being. It doesn't get paid to an estate. So it's got to be a um, an approved dependent, financial dependent, or and there's so many, you know, very, very strictly defined rules around that too. Uh, absolutely. And that's a fantastic point because, you know, if you think about life cover in particular, we're taking out life cover, which hopefully we don't claim on for a very long time. But when we do, it's because we've passed away. And, and so the money will um, uh, essentially be paid to a beneficiary of some description. Yeah. And, and, and the point you make is a good one because if it's held outside super, the range of beneficiaries is quite broad. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and it could just be paid into your estate depending on how it's owned. But, but when you hold that cover inside super, um, the trustee is bound by sets, a set of rules as to who they're allowed to pay those proceeds to. And you're right, it has to be a human. Um, you know, but, but, but that, that range of beneficiaries is quite limited because they need to be a dependent and dependent yeah. is a defined term inside the superannuation legislation. So, yeah. so the, the, the outcome from an estate planning point of view could be particular potentially different yeah. um but on the flip side um that that is also a benefit of holding insurance cover inside super because the proceeds when they're paid out i mean a, a super fund many super funds offer binding death benefit nominations for example and yes. so if you know who you want to leave your money to and that person meets the required beneficiary de- definition um then there's no, you know, that then that using a binding death benefit nomination means that those proceeds will be paid, assuming it's a valid nomination, will be paid to that person. 
Um, and that decision is not one that the trustee is making. They're, they're following your order under that binding, assuming it's yeah. valid, binding yeah. nomination. Yeah. Um, and those decisions are sometimes more difficult to challenge. And so in an age where um, estates and wills are sometimes challenged in the family courts, yeah. um, then a binding death benefit nomination may in fact be useful in some situations. Um, but again, um, they're fraught with danger because the valid the nomination must be valid. It's got to be the right beneficiary and a whole bunch of other things. But, but it is a potentially useful tool um, yeah. in the right hands. Thank you so, so very much, Fabian. This is actually a, a topic that I'm really, really interested in, but we're running out of time. It almost deserves its own session as well yeah. because of yeah. some of the complexities. So... Um, uh, if people have any questions, I would encourage them to just pop them at the bottom in, in the comments section and hopefully we uh, will be able to address them. I really appreciate your time, Fabian, and good luck with uh, in the industry and with all the changes that's happening. So it, it's, it's, there's never a dull day. <laughs> never never a dull moment in the superannuation game. But uh, but thank you, Princess, for having me and, and for your time and, and, and hopefully um, you, you've enjoyed the video. Thank you so much. No problem. There we have it. I hope you enjoyed that session. Fabian and I covered quite a wide ranging scope of topics that would help demystify some of the um, pitfalls, pros and cons of having insurance inside and outside of super. If you have any questions, please let us know. Um, leave a comment below if there is a particular topic you would like us to hone in on and, and expand um, if that's something that you're interested in. Uh, thank you again for your support. I hope you subscribe and click like and also forward this video to anyone whom you feel might be interested or might benefit from understanding insurance inside super. Until our next video, thank you.